Hello, welcome. This is Hunter Gatewood for the California Improvement Network. We appreciate you joining us today for the first in a three webinar series we're doing on alternatives to face-to-face -face visits. We are recording this session. We find that a lot of people do uh, participate with the webinars um, after the fact. Um, and um, so we appreciate you being here with us and our speaker, Jim Myers, who I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, your lines are muted. You can chat questions to us. Um, or to the speaker at any time. Jim, would you move us to the rest of the housekeeping? Thank you. Um, we do post the recording about a week after the, um, after the webinar live session today. Please refer friends, colleagues to that website or go back yourself if there's something that you want to hear and see again. Uh, we find that, again, people do really use the recording as a way to um, get Get the content later. There's also past uh, past webinars that we've done that are that are located on the CIN page there that you'll see the the web address for. Um, if you have logistical questions, if you would select organizer um, or organizer and panelists, if, if you chat in, if you're having trouble hearing or connectivity problems, we will do our best to help you. If you want to um, have questions for our presenter. Um, you can do uh, presenter only or just do everyone and we will, we will get to as many of those questions as we can. There will be a quick three question survey that will come to you as you, as you start to log off the webinar platform at the end. You'll also get it by email. Please do respond to that. We really do use that input to um, figure out how to make these sessions better and there's a question in there for future topics that you might want to hear. Um, as the California Improvement Network, uh, we're always figuring out ways to offer technical assistance and training um, across both the safety net and commercial sectors of healthcare in California. So there's a lot of topics we could cover, and we use your uh, the input of people like you, people who do, do participate in these offerings, to figure out what is needed out there in the in the work world. Um, next, now I'll introduce introduce Jim. So this is our speaker, Jim Myers. Uh, Dr. Jim Myers is a doctor of public health. Um, he has years of experience working in senior health leadership, health information technology, and health policy and, health policy and politics. He has uh, been a C-suite level leader at government funded health organizations and networks. Um, he participates as a national leader in population and community health, also has uh, academic teaching experience, and does mentoring in politics, policy, and, and especially the arena of, of health IT. Um, he uh, has a political appointment right now at, in Alameda County. I think he's a health commissioner. Um, he has done, to today's topic, he has, is a very active coach for organizations who want to optimize their patient portal's effectiveness and the services provided. He does uh, in-person and phone-based strategic planning and tactical coaching for portal teams. He's assembled with the teams he's coached, the, all the different organizations he's worked with, over 500 patient portal resources um, and shares all of those freely. So you're going to want to see that name, get that email, and, um, and maybe be in touch with him. We have worked together. Um, I've seen him do practice coaching on portals, um, and he's really effective, practical, and really helps people dig into what's going to make their portals best for, for their patients, most useful and practical. Um, and, and, and it's been fun to, fun to work with him in the past. He's going to talk today about his top 10 current ideas for making your patient portal more effective. As I said before, please chat in questions at any time, and I'll help, help him weave those into the presentation. He, um, yeah, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go from here. So um, without any more explanation, Jim, I will turn it over to you to start the presentation. Thanks, Hunter. Uh, let me switch over to my slides. Great. Um, well, what a great opportunity to speak uh, to this great network. Um, I also uh, attend the network presentations and had uh, quite a wonderful experience uh, working on other projects with Hunter. And uh, when asked to to speak on this topic, I, you know, what came to mind for me was what's a great way to share uh, what's working with patient portals right now. And I think. You know, over the past uh, six years working with uh, provider organizations in the safety net in California and Colorado, you know, I've helped uh, teams uh, plan for, launch, relaunch, or optimize their patient portals. 
and during those times, uh, and we've all had this, these moments where you're on a coaching call or you're on a, you know, a call of some sort or in a team meeting where you have an aha moment. I like the, thinking of things in terms of aha moments where you all just sort of pause and go, oh yeah, that's, you know, that makes tons of sense. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. So this is really uh, top 10 ideas for optimizing your patient portal might be uh, renamed the top 10 ahas uh, from the past six years that really came along uh, and made a big deal. Sometimes it was a game changer and sometimes it was just something that really took a team to the next level. Um, either enrollment, um, if you're launching or relaunching or, or encouraging better use of the portal. And I, I find that, that it's, it's much more fun and I think much more useful to kind of talk about those aha moments because they meant so much uh, to, the, to the teams and often seem to connect better than just sort of tallying up the most successful kinds of optimizing projects that are out there. Um, and so uh, that's what we'll do today. I will share those with you and uh, I'll do this, uh, really the learning objectives are, you know, for those folks on the call who are new to the patient portal concept, uh, we'll just very quickly go through some basics. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the idea sharing community that uh, I'm part of, uh, that I coach across uh, uh, a little over 25 organizations right now that get together periodically to share, uh, either in a you know, coaching call format or uh, in a webinar sharing format um, on a specific topic. I'll then go into the top 10 optimization ideas, uh, and then at the very end we'll conclude with some a slide just kind of touching on where the portal might help uh, us all in the future. And we have a survey question for you. There it is. Does your organization have an active patient portal? So let's uh, remind each other at this stage kind of where folks are on this call. So go ahead and vote. And after about 15 seconds or so total, I'll ask you to vote quickly. We'll take a look at our results. Can the attendees see the results now? I can't see them. <laughs> I still see the question. And I wonder, Hunter, do you see the uh, results? No, I'm seeing the placeholder slide again. I know that, um, so Helen must have closed the survey. And usually the results now. pop up. Helen, can you see the results? I don't see the results. It is, right, but yeah, it did pop up for me. All right, let's just move on. Oh, on then. give me one uh, second. Give me one moment. Give me a second. Sure. I can get them for you. Oh, there we go. There, there we go. go. Okay. Yes, I've been active for between one and two, uh, 50 percent, and yes, I've been active for over two years, 50 percent. So thanks to everyone for taking the poll. Uh, gives us a good idea who's on the call. And let's first go through some basic patient portal basics. I know there will be folks who uh, pull down this recording, so I'll still give some basic information even though all of us on this call, active on the call, have uh, a portal underway. Uh, basically a patient portal is uh, uh, folks, uh, either patient, family, or caregiver uh, would like to, to ask a question or make connections somehow with their provider or provider organization uh, outside a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, it's often uh, done through a secure co connection. Um, all the vendors out there that are in the marketplace uh, are HIPAA compliant. We, we ha I have had a client or two have attempted their own in-house settings, but they're uh, uh, thought to be completely secure connections through internet links, smartphones, computers, and uh, more and more today uh, vendor applications on smartphones. And that's the general idea of, of the patient portal. Uh, the national trends we see right now for uh, drivers and benefits and barriers, uh, meaningful use is still in play, um, uh, different stages for different people, but uh, today, uh, and, you know, if an, uh, 
eligible professional sent the secure message using an electronic messaging function to at least one patient during the reporting period, uh, then they're eligible to attest. Um, so that's still a pretty big reason why folks are actively using patient portals. Uh, we certainly see uh, innovations in the patient-centered medical home arena that are driving themselves to the portal. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, certainly health reform is uh, on pause a bit. Uh, not sure exactly where it's heading forward, but clearly uh, clinics uh, are looking for strategic differentiators uh, um, in the for-profit and non-profit realm in particular, um, and a portal is a big part of that. Uh, benefits, uh, what you see there under patients, uh, there on the benefits part of the slide in the center, uh, that's actually in, listed in, um, in priority order of use. Uh, so secure messaging, uh, messaging is still the number one use uh, four portals today. But you can see the list there of the different ways that uh, folks are using their patient portal. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later when we talk about marketing. And then clinics and providers themselves see certainly a benefit of less calls, administrative efficiencies uh, are hoping for those things to occur, um, pushing routine tasks uh, to those who are credentialed to do them to the max of their maximum of their credentialing. Um, and then uh, hopefully leaving more time for critical patients by, by if you will, um, handling the, the lower level things uh, through the portal if possible, uh, leaving the more uh, critical things to the face-to-face -face time. And then on the, on the far right-hand side, the barriers uh, that we see still existing today for our patients are the digital divide, certainly. Uh, there's not uh, yet an equitable way across um, our ethnicities and uh, um, different uh, categories of underserved populations in terms of using the portal and access to the portal. And that still is being worked on uh, and still has a long way to go. We certainly have literacy issues, uh, standard language literacy, but also digital literacy. Uh, I'm reminded of working with a patient group uh, at San Francisco General Hospital, uh, an AIDS, uh, homeless AIDS group and uh, AIDS patient population that was using the portal um, to interface with their provider and 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 we taught we were teaching basic uh, you know, keyboard use at the very beginning, including what does the term return mean? Uh, so when you think of entering something and then you look down on your keyboard, the word enter is not there. It's basic things like that we're learning that are still major barriers for a lot of folks uh, that are connecting uh, uh, to their portal. Uh, certainly language, uh, some of the key vendors out there are now uh, beginning to launch the Spanish portal option uh, and uh, but that uh, still has a long way to go for multiple language choices. Uh, privacy concerns, I would say clearly uh, what we're seeing in, our, in, in polling is that patients are very concerned about privacy uh, when they first start using the portal, but it drops quickly off the list of concerns once they engage with the portal. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good way to think of it is if I trust my provider, I trust my portal, and that, that's pretty clear uh, what we're finding in our surveys. Uh, with regard to barriers for providers, um, these things are still uh, uh, the common ones, uh, the potential work, uh, work ad, um, that falls off the list once they begin using the portal uh, and finding the, the, the savings of time from not having to make phone calls or do some phone call follow-up tracking and constantly trying to reach the patient during the day. Uh, lack of reimbursements is still there. Uh, there are um, uh, you know, accountable care organization platforms that are now beginning to, to fold this into their thinking with regard to cost, but those who are independent of that are still looking at uh, the impact of not uh, being reimbursed for their time. Uh, inappropriate use by patients occurs generally in the first six months of the use of the portal. Uh, you'll see a small percentage of the patients doing that. Uh, we have uh, seen really good resources out there of common responses that are uh, caring but uh, pointed uh, to uh, remind patients that what they're writing uh, becomes part of their official record. So uh, we, we've got that in our resource center that I'll make available to you. And then liability for security breaches, uh, you know, that comes and goes in terms of a pro provider concern. Uh, you know, it's almost uh, salient today with, uh, with the release of information that Yahoo has uh, seen another large breach. Uh, you know, then it all, all of a sudden folks are, again, concerned about security. Uh, but I will say that providers and patients alike, uh, once they begin using it, the issue of security breaches falls off uh, the screen uh, and when we do survey. And uh, elements of successful planning. This is a busy slide. I will focus your eyes here uh, now uh, to a few of them. 
But just the, the, the general message is that uh, patient portal um, launch, relaunch, optimization uh, really entails quite a few different areas that need to occur almost simultaneously. And so re it's very, very important to have a very good strategic planning process in place. We'll go over some of these during the ahas uh, that I've collected. But certainly, uh, there are, are a lot of elements of a successful patient portal launch and optimization. We'll talk in the AHAs today about patient portal teams and relaunching and launching and optimization planning, uh, patient engagement and feedback, uh, marketing and workflows will come up today. But there are, as you can see, other areas uh, that one needs to plan for as well. Uh, where, do, where do the ahas come from? Uh, I thought I would spend just a, a very short moment uh, just letting you know about uh, the clinic uh, and, and the clinics and, and, and organizations that have uh, provided uh, these ideas and ahas that you'll hear today. They mostly did not come from me. Um, through a process of coaching and idea sharing on patient portals since 2010, uh, now uh, uh, over 25 organizations, and as we enter January, it'll now start to eclipse 50 in California and Colorado. Uh, that's that's the teams of folks that uh, are in organizations that participated in the past six years. Uh, uh, it often starts with uh, an on-site three and a half hour uh, strategic planning session that goes through the work plan elements that you saw in the previous slide. Uh, then, uh, then coaching and working through a one-year Tiger Team approach with work, a workbook and metrics to follow uh, that we catch up on a monthly on a monthly basis. Uh, these are monthly team check-ins, uh, but we also do a monthly idea sharing webinar that that varies by um, topic as people um, uh, identify a priority topic areas they want to learn more from each other on, and then we'll have a, a monthly webinar that we share uh, ideas on. And then ultimately, as Hunter was mentioning, uh, these, this has now grown to be a, a little over 500 resources that have been uh, uh, collected that are available to those on, uh, that, that wish to. Uh, and you can reach those through me, uh, through emailing me, or uh, we have some other options for uh, uh, reaching out to some of those resources that we'll identify at the end of the presentation. And now top 10 ideas. Uh, and when, when we talk about this, I'm going to identify ahas, the actual aha that occurred. Uh, there will be some bullet uh, points that identify you know, what it was done or what the idea was that really made a difference. These are things, again, that move the needle on enrollment or use. And then I'll also sh uh, share uh, specific um, resources that you can use that will help you uh, with this particular area. And so my first aha, um, if you run, if you just run patient portals as an IT project, you will fail. Engaging patients is a core value, and the portal is a core function in all of our care team processes. And this was from a QI chief that uh, commented during a three and a half hour workshop uh, that we did to help them relaunch their portal. And here's uh, in the beginning now, so we'll do a countdown. This is number 10 in the countdown. Uh, and it's this idea that dedicating a single a year to a team uh, is, a, is a great idea. Um, people then gather or rally around the idea of let's really make a difference with our portal during this year. And I have found that the teams that do that um, are the most successful um, and versus just saying we're relaunching starting today. Um, they have an appointed team leader that is often uh, approved with specific levels of FTE hours, maybe a half-time job or a full-time job, that then also points uh, resources directly on the need uh, to really focus for that year. Uh, we have champions on the team, providers, staff, IT, front desk, um, uh, involvement, um, and then periodically uh, other champions will come in and out during the year as needed. Uh, uh, we have dedicated FTE hours that have been approved by uh, the C-suite. Often the CEO will sign a letter off uh, with this one-year timeline. They meet monthly, typically, sometimes twice a month, and they have regular reporting. All of these are functions of a successful, uh, uh, again, launch of a patient portal relaunch or a year dedicated to optimizing. And here's some specific resources uh, that I've made available uh, to you all, a case study that was done here in this past year of, of this dedicated year process. It's a great poster uh, that was done that we've collected in a PDF format that really shows the, the journey through. I think it's a great thing to show, uh, to look at and to show your team. The patient portal policies and procedures, I've, I've provided an example of that uh, to start folks off with uh, how they might want to look at make sure they, making sure they capture all of the different elements of patient portal operations. And then uh, a patient portal supervisor job description as well. And number nine. 
using a work plan. Uh, it's important, I think, uh, to note that the teams that have been the most successful have really taken a look at all those elements, spaced them out properly, and developed a work plan. Um, I'm going to show you here in a second uh, an example of how that was laid out. But this process is clearly uh, of, of running a very good patient portal is much more involved than most people in clinic operations today think. Um, it's, it's often handed off to an IT department. Um, and, and that's where we see a lot of need to relaunch. Um, and so d d uh, using a dedicated work plan, tracking it, uh, getting the C-suite to sign off, of an, off on it so they have a really good sense of what the level of uh, work that's going to be required is. And then uh, one, of the, one of the key things that, that I think we learned this past year is that vendors are getting more and more involved in helping people to launch relaunch and optimize than they were in the past. They see this as a core um, part of their business now, the patient portal, where I think prior to last year, uh, they saw the EHR itself as their primary uh, um, uh, product and not necessarily the portal portion of it. So that, that's, uh, that's been a big change as well. So here's the aha that we had from a team leader that we were working with last year. Uh, the spreadsheet of the, you know, for each part of our work plan was a hit with my portal team and our CEO. The team loves seeing progress across each area at our meetings. Nothing got lost. The CEO loves seeing the color-coded progress. She could focus on the most important support needed. And let me show you what that, uh, what that looked like. So reminding us of the elements of success and then moving them one by one into the work plan itself. And so this is an Excel spreadsheet that uh, I will make available to you all. Um, that has each of the major work areas. Uh, so uh, that's what you see there is the example major work area. You see uh, that there's a check-in on the spreadsheet across the first six months, uh, and then you have space then for the second six months. And then you see for each of the uh, sample activities, the action plans for each work area. Uh, imagine doing something uh, like uh, developing your patient portal team and needing to pick a portal overall team leader, the clinic leader, the su staff support leader, the IT. Um, you will see uh, there, there there's a place to put that information and the status of actually completing it. And what's really liked about this by CEOs is that they can focus their eye down on those marks. Um, and then here's my shared resource for you, the work plan tracking spreadsheet. And number eight, um, and um, Hunter, I'll just check in real quick. Um, I heard a click, a couple of sounds of clicking in and out. I don't know if that's you trying to to, to give me a chat question or not. No, thank you for checking in. I did not see anything in the chat, so let me just take this opportunity to remind people that, as, especially as we go through the top ten, this is the time we, we hope that you will have specific questions. And um, again, Jim has agreed to pause um, mid midpoint um, to clarify any urgent questions, and I'll collect the other more general questions for, for the end. So please chat in at any time. But yeah, Jim, nothing, nothing yet. Thank you, Hunter. Please interrupt at any time any, uh, with, uh, with those chats. Um, so number eight, um, counting down, um, supporting organic workflows. Um, I, certainly, um, those folks who follow uh, what they currently do today and look to that as how they will engage the different work activities, often called tickets, that come out of the daily patient portal um, workflow. So you can imagine, uh, if you will, uh, a patient having a question for their care team and then engaging their portal at home, sending in that, uh, that question and then logging out. And then the question then becomes uh, a ticket then at the clinic, what to do with that ticket. Um, so the question, you know, I think what we look for is as these activities come in, as, I, as I'm requesting a, a, maybe a, a medication refill, as I'm looking at different options for communicating and different topics that I might want to have a question about, where do they go and where would they have gone had that been a phone call? Um, and so thinking about that and trying to work as hard as you can and having the care teams lead the discussions around how to set up these workflows so that you do follow your normal cultural patterns for how you want to handle uh, these, act these activities that come in, these tickets that come in. And the aha that I had was from a CMO, uh, Chief Medical Officer, that we had in an urban Denver um, thoroughly qualified health center. Setting up a patient portal work workflow task went much more smoothly when we first asked ourselves, how do we do it now? And I, I would really um, think 
focusing the story to, you know, you have some providers who really like to have a personal connection with their patients. There are some clinics that uh, have clinic operations or clinic functions that are much more personal. You think of an oncology clinic, for example, and, uh, and others that are uh, uh, acute, uh, acute care or they, they might be um, your standard, standard family practice clinic where you may or may not have providers who want to, you know, want to have email contact directly with their patients. In some of those circumstances, you may want to move that to a nurse manager or a, an MA uh, for a, a certain impaneled group. What do you do now, and how does it work best within your culture and your providers? Um, that is, if you follow that thinking when you're setting up the workflows for the patient portal, then the uptick of using it, the actual use of it, is more likely to occur. And this is this idea of do we have direct or do we have MAs, uh, nurses, or pharmacists uh, involving themselves uh, between the patient and the provider signing off. Um, there are some locations like the Veterans Administration that has a number of protocol, pre-protocoled um, um, allowances for their MAs and RNs to, um, to sign off and, and respond for the provider without the provider seeing the response. And likewise, um, um, in other settings like Kaiser, uh, I, I've uh, worked with them and, and many of their providers, even in the primary care setting, want to have direct contact with their patients. Uh, in fact, when Kaiser first, uh, the first five years of their patient portal, they required all of their providers to have direct contact with patients as the questions came in. Now we see a little more involvement in each of those questions. Uh, what is the question? How much does the provider really need to be involved and in whether they need to sign off on the response or not? And a shared resource, uh, we had uh, a really good uh, set of patient portal workflow examples put together by one of our clinics and I provided that as, as uh, a resource to share. And number seven, let data drive your focus. Um, and the big, the big one here is um, we actually realized there were a lot of folks who d held back on providing data about the patient portal until they could make it pretty slick, until they could get a, a, a third-party product in and, uh, and then organize a great dashboard. Uh, and, and I think that the, the real the lesson there was uh, that the providers actually provide in a simple format, um, often Excel exportable format, that you can use uh, to, to get you started on, on letting the data drive your focus. And I, I'm, I can't tell you how many times I've worked with folks who are really working hard to make it look good, and I say, well, what does your data, what does your vendor provide? They don't know, they go back, and it's uh, you know, equal to or better than what they're trying to put together themselves. Uh, in particular, the data that I think is good for teams to, to take a look at, um, especially after the first six months or year, is take a look at, a continual look at your login error rates. Um, that is provided by, uh, I, I don't know a provider, a vendor that doesn't provide that information, actually. Um, and it's, it's, it's really important to keep an eye almost uh, weekly, if not daily, on whether you have uh, login errors, like uh, specific to the vendor's product. Um, versus uh, the patient having trouble remembering their password. So it provides you information on both of those uh, by looking at the amount of time spent on the login page and whether they made it to the next level or not uh, and whether there are alternatives they've chosen on the login screen um, to help them. So uh, that's a very good uh, report to continue to look at throughout the life of, of uh, data reporting on your portal. And then the other one that seems to be a really a big one that's catching up now, I think, uh, is the amount of time that patients are spending on each of the different portal pages. Getting a real sense of what's working for patients. What are they going into the portal for? Uh, is that what you want them to go in for? Uh, are you going to target marketing uh, to, to change that behavior to help uh, empower them in a different way or engage them in a different way? You'll know that by looking at your patient uh, portal met page metrics uh, and encouraging you to do that. And so the aha for this area was actually a story we heard from uh, one of our coaching calls where the, uh, this, is, this is, was the report that was read, portals also increase patient loyalty. Patients with access to a portal are 13 times more likely to schedule a return visit. Over 18 months, practices that adopted portals had an 80% retention rate compared to a 67% retention rate of practices without portals. And what it was was a marketing director who had seen this, had reported it to the clinic CEO who said, are we collecting you know, good information like this about our own portal? And it really opened everyone's eyes of the impact that data can have 
at all levels of the organization. And I want to particularly say, you know, it's exciting to see this kind of inf detailed information. People, you know, I would see it uh, in, in maybe a newsletter uh, to staff or in, maybe it's mentioned in a staff meeting. But also, it, uh, you know, it, it tells us things about our portal that remind us that the portal's there and we might consider using it in, in, in other ways that we don't currently use it. And I'm thinking now as we move more and more into uh, arenas where we're reimbursed on our, on our uh, care, care planning successes, on our outcomes, uh, is there ways to reach out uh, using the patient portal to our patients to take the next step um, that's required to, to check off that you've done well in, in, in your accountable care organization in a particular area or not? I'm thinking of uh, diabetic patients that are identified and then uh, the requirement to get full reimbursement may be then you have uh, checked off that you provided a follow-on uh, counseling session on weight loss if that's a part of it. Uh, and so uh, allowing for that reminder, allowing for the patients to check that off that they've attended it, allowing them to set up an appointment, all of that can be done on, the, on many of our patient portals out there today. And that's a great way to encourage the use of your patient portal. Different ways that data can drive focus, uh, we've, I've, I certainly have listed here um, different types of measures um, that I have seen uh, successfully used on the implementation side and on the impact side. Um, these are the most used uh, measures that I see uh, uh, working with my uh, idea sharing group. Uh, trends in enrollments and active use of, uh, from the very beginning and continue to be used as even as a four or five year uh, mature uh, portal. Uh, most used features, error reports we've, we've talked about, um, but also this is where you'd bring in your provider and patient satisfaction with the portal. But then when you think of the impact measures, uh, are we actually seeing a reduction in call volume? Uh, are we seeing a reduction in, in the missed appointments? How satisfied are patients not just with their portal, but how satisfied are they with their care? Are we making a difference uh, in the impact of how we deliver our care? And I would like to focus uh, now on one of the types of charts that we see actively used with almost all of our um, participants in our group. And I want to focus your eye to the right where it says target and then enrolled to date and then active users. Uh, and that space between enrolled to date and active use is a huge gap. Um, and that's what we're trying, if you will, by having good planning to reduce that size. You don't want the distance between your active users and those who have enrolled to be that great. It's very common to see this kind of projection. It's, it's, it's not uncommon to have clinics really push for enrollment, uh, give out con, com, you know, competitions, uh, con, incentive bonuses, um, actually employ, uh, you know, get volunteers out or uh, new employed, uh, short-term employed folks to get out there to enroll, enroll, enroll but it's really not driving active use. So what we, you really want to do when you uh, launch, relaunch, or really if you want to focus on optimizing, is to look at ways to get your patients to more actively use versus just enroll in the portal. And this is the very uh, number one uh, um, data slide that, that we see having the greatest impact, um, is to find out the percentage of patients reporting that their patient portal saved a call or a visit to the clinic. Um, and, you know, I think I asked uh, folks on one of our idea sharing webinars, where do they post this? Where, who gets to see this? And they, and, and universally we're saying anywhere we can think to post it for our staff. Um, we put it in our, in our staff uh, uh, lounge. We, we, we put it in our reports and our newsletters that go out to our, our staff as well. And we have shown it to our patients uh, in the waiting rooms as well. So it's a pretty successful way, I think, to show the impact of patient portal. And a shared resource for you, I have provided an example patient portal dashboard and an example quarterly CEO report uh, as ways to share data. And number six, using the portal in your care plan. Um, and this is becoming more and more possible as uh, portal vendors are becoming more and more um, flexible in how the portal is used. Uh, portals have uh, historically been set packages with limited ability to do changing. And if you're in that mode and you've not really re you know, returned back to your vendor to, to see how much you can change your portal to make it more user friendly or to, be, uh, to actively engage your patients better, it's time to go back to your portal. Uh, a vendor. It's, uh, there are lots of ways now that you can put in pre-visit um, uh, surveys. Uh, why, do, why, why will you be coming to your visit tomorrow? Uh, send out a note to your patient that there's something in their uh, survey in their portal, uh, pre-visit survey. They go on their portal. They put that in. It's helpful for huddles and preparatory um, things that you can do prior to the visit. 
but also engaging in ways uh, which I'll show now as an example. Um, here's, uh, here's the AHA, a portal that provides mostly administrative functions such as scheduling appointments or obtaining lab results will be helpful but not as interesting to patients. Patients will be more likely to use a portal that is designed to address their personal needs. Portals that include interactive and personalized tools will be more engaging. And I want to really focus on one that came up this past year that made a huge difference in that particular clinic's um, use of the portal. And it's, it's integrating uh, in a mental health um, clinic setting uh, a consumer recovery measure. And I, want to, I circled there the uh, hope, growth, safety, social symptom. These are questions that relate to these specific areas. It shows the provider um, uh, the uh, the current status of the patient it encourages they encourage the patient to go onto their portal when they're not uh, at literally preparing to come for the visit or that uh, that they fill it out when they feel the most vulnerable in their lives they can go to their um, patient portal they can fill this out uh, and then they can see uh, the provider can go in and see that they have filled it out and see their scores across these different dimensions uh, what's the real interesting part about this and the real aha for me as a, as a coach was to see a huge jump. If you look there in total uh, pins issued or pins activated, that's the credentials to, uh, to use the portal uh, for new patients, uh, uh, even for old patients that have not activated their pins. Uh, and uh, you'll see there uh, in J June and July a major jump. In, uh, in total pins activated from 1176 to 2056. You'll also see that the, the instrument, the CRM there, uh, the use of it in one month jumped. And this is, uh, so they initiated uh, in May the, the CRM onto their portal. They had a few, they had uses in June and huge, a big jump in July, but it actually drove also, of course, the use of the portal. Um, and folks coming back, figuring out what their pin is, getting a new pin, whatever it took, to, to be able to get onto their portal because their provider wants this CRM filled out. They want to connect with them outside of the visits. So that's pretty powerful. And number five, um, use champions. Um, you know, I, I, there's an old saying that champions tell stories that people believe. It's clear that those people who use something uh, feel very strongly about it, tell you a story about how they used it is a powerful way to convince people to try it. Um, and so, you know, uh, um, using champions across the spectrum of different types of uh, specialties or, or functions within the clinic, having a, a champion that's a provider, having a champion that's an MA, a nurse, have them speak at the pro staff meetings or all staff meetings, uh, tell their story, uh, show a short video, uh, provided a free video um, that, that, is for, that is safety net patients talking about the portal and why it's so meaningful in their lives. I've got a video that's free to you all that you can use that's two minutes, uh, two and a half minutes long that talks about providers and why their portal has been so successful for them. Uh, these stories are powerful. Um, and then having, uh, you know, a Dr. Smith stand up who's used it and have her say, you know, this was one of my patients. This is how they used it. This was how it was incredible in our relationship. And this is how I empowered my patient. Uh, those kind of stories drive people, tell stories, put ideas in providers' minds about the value of the portal. Uh, provider and patient stories, uh, uh, those uh, are an also a great way to use your champions. Uh, have them connect with you, uh, connect you to a patient. Have them tell the story. Box that story up with a picture. Put it in an email. Send it out to your providers and staff. It gives them one more story they can tell patients uh, and encourage patients to use the portal. Uh, and then I've also seen these stories uh, framed uh, into uh, frames in an elevator and other waiting areas, and even patient bathrooms. Uh, and so again, using champions to tell stories is a great way. This was the aha that we had from a portal champion champion of uh, within the visit coordinators at one clinic. I believe that the portal has become more accepted by staff as they become more knowledgeable about it. Staff who are also patients use it. Visit coordinators and triage nurses use it daily, so it has become habit for us. Most of our staff feels like that it is a great communication tool to take advantage of. Shared resources, uh, as I mentioned earlier uh, in, uh, just a second ago, um, there's links to YouTube videos that you can use, so you can set that up in your all staff meeting or your pro staff meeting. Click on it, uh, it's a couple minutes long. It's, pa it's actual patients and actual providers from the safety net uh, talking about the portal. And there's an address 
there where you can go to it uh, um, uh, right after this uh, webinar if you would like. Number four, <clears throat> now we're getting into the top four, uh, making feedback easy. Um, there was a real aha, I think, um, when we realized, you know, when people started to realize that folks want to give you feedback about the portal, whether it's patients or providers or staff, but we don't make it easier, easy for them to do it. Either the surveys are too long or the process by which we get their feedback is too complicated or too time consuming. And what we found, um, we took this from one particular clinic uh, that started uh, regularly using an online survey process with uh, SurveyMonkey, as you can imagine, as one of the products. Uh, the results come back in an Excel format, so you don't have to manipulate it too much to, uh, to then turn it around and show folks. Uh, you can email a link to it, um, and you can put in you know, very useful information right in front of the provider, staff member, or the patient uh, about how long it takes, how many questions that, uh, are on it, so they know what they're getting into when they hit that link. Uh, you show them results uh, when they take the, the survey and they answer a question. They get to see a slide that shows uh, what everyone's, uh, what the uh, tally has been across all. Uh, you can take action and report results quickly. Um, and uh, that's that's probably the most important way to get folks to take it again is to show them in a in a, a um, webinar uh, in a um, report what you've done for uh, to take action from the previous uh, feedback survey. And then targeting the feedback, you can set up online surveys to have specific addresses for different departments and different uh, functions within the clinic, and that's helpful as well. Here's an example of a, of a uh, CEO's email sent out to a physician, Dr. Lee, making it very clear she appreciates uh, the, that, that the provider is taking the time to take the survey, tells it six questions, takes five minutes, there's a free Starbucks card, uh, and then the link to the survey. Here's some results uh, from that same survey, um, same uh, CEO uh, gave me uh, for this presentation. They did one, they got this kind of feedback from the patients that they uh, gave the survey to. So those percent, uh, percentage of folks agreeing or strongly agreeing to the answers, the statements that you see there, that's powerful. Uh, it's great to show your patients, uh, and you know, we, this is often shown in patient advisory group meetings, and it's also great to show your, your board. Provider team satisfaction, again, percentage agreeing or strongly agreeing to a statement. And I think this often overcomes those providers who have not tried it uh, very often or at all, who have negative things to say about it because of the perceived potential uh, impact it would have on their uh, interactions with their patients. They see this kind of uh, result and it helps them to, it encourages them to use it more. The aha that uh, came from a patient advisory group, uh, I love telling this one because we were all so surprised and it's been used so much in marketing since uh, I heard this clinic patient say this. I want to be able to put my kids to bed and then deal with scheduling the next, doc next doctor's appointment. By the time I get someone on the phone, I have forgotten something. I'd rather have time to think about what I need and write it down. And that's a real positive reason why saving time is the, is the overall category. Patients love the portal because they can use it when it makes the most sense for them. Uh, to interact uh, with their provider, it's often when the kids are already are in bed and they have time to actually sit down and think. Shared resources, an example online survey for you, both for patients and providers slash staff. Number three, we're getting there, we're getting closer to the, the top, uh, top one and two. Making feedback easy, number two, virtual feedback groups. Uh, this was, in the past six years, this was clearly my biggest aha, and that is... Hi, Jim and Hunter. Yes. Quick question. This is Helen. Yes. Um, I have a question from that I can see from Alan. He submitted through the questions box and not the chat box. Yes. Um, can I go ahead and read that to you? Please do. Um, it says, um, for mes messaging members slash individuals through the portal, did you find any preferences between email communication versus communication posted on the portal? This could be clinical reminders, such as getting your annual flu shot, email versus portal communication. Yes, that's a great one. Uh, thanks for that question. Um, in fact, we're finding those people that put, that, that here's the general guideline. You want to um, communicate with patients on personal, specific patient-related information through the portal. You want to communicate with patients uh, on general announcements, uh, announcements about flu shots, uh, fundraising things for the clinic, 
even highlighting a, a patient or a provider and telling their story about uh, using the clinic, you want to do that through the emails that have been collected, usually in the marketing department holds those. That's a much different uh, kind of message interaction, and that prohibits the situation where those patients that really only want to open their portal and go through that process are going to do that for very personal um, interactions that they have. Um, and also then the portal should be encouraged to be used for those personal questions because they can be routed when they come in faster and more accurately than straight emails to the provider. There are some providers who don't want uh, to use their regular email system uh, or the clinic uh, email address that they have. Uh, they prefer to get their emails from patients through the portal. Uh, and then, you know, again, the overall goal here is to not send spam, if you will, uh, to patients to their portal. That otherwise, they, when they see that they have a portal message, they may not go into the portal to take a look at it, even though it might be important for that specific patient. Uh, hopefully, that's, that helps answer that question. Uh, I'll continue on with number three, and, and uh, if the um, questioner has uh, further questions, I'll take those too. So virtual feedback groups. Uh, this came to me actually from a presentation in 2012 from Kaiser, uh, had, a, had a free gathering of safety net clinics to talk about portals. And they had this unique setup so that when you first signed up for the patient portal, they asked you if you wanted to be part of a virtual feedback group. Uh, they would ask you a question or two once a month, you'd be on a list, they wouldn't bother you for anything else, and they had 30,000 people sign up in the first three, uh, three years out of 8 million users. Uh, of course, you know, I hear that and I'm like, you don't want to ask an open question, but you can get great feedback. And so uh, taking that the next step further, a lot of the clinics I've been working with also have a virtual feedback group with their providers and staff. And so they, they find those super users, those people who are you know, very excited about the portal uh, and its use, and they get their email addresses, they shoot them questions now and then when they try something new, or if they have a, a new version of the uh, portal come, uh, come through, how are things working? So uh, virtual feedback groups are a phenomenal way to get fast and good, reliable feedback. And then my aha for that uh, was from a virtual feedback from a, a, an MA uh, during the beta test that a, one clinic had for one of their new portal versions. The link to the immunization page is no longer working. It's, you know, you may not find out uh, right away that a page isn't working uh, in the normal process of feedback that you have in your clinic, but if you have people in a beta group or a feedback group or a virtual group, it's a great way for them to communicate back with you when things are not working. Now, the, down to the last two. Know your target population, your target patient. Um, often uh, clinics uh, see a, a wide variety of patients and they identify through that process those who don't have, let's say, an equal or equitable way of reaching to their clinic as the other patients that they serve. It may be uh, Spanish migrant workers. It might be categories of patients that don't have easy access to the clinic for one reason or another. And you know um, that there's a possibility that the portal might be the way to reach them. Uh, how should you communicate with them? How, how, do they, how would they use the portal? How do they reach out to the portal? And this was shocking to all of us when we heard this. One of our clinics, to get to know this patient pop, certain patient population group better, did a tech survey to that population. And they found out that 50% of them have smartphone access to the internet, internet and only 20% of them have desktop computer access to the internet. And they decided we're going to focus more on our vendor smartphone application right now. And that was a group they were trying to reach. Uh, and I know that this particular group was uh, older migrant workers. And they realized that they carried a phone. And if they didn't carry a phone, then their, their children carried a phone. And that's the way they interacted with the internet. And so send, getting them on, uh, on the application that the vendor had was really important for them to interface more successfully with, uh, with this particular population group. And also texting them uh, to their phones in Spanish um, was also a, a very significant change in how they reached out to these particular patients. And so I, I sent you that resource, uh, that text survey that was done, and you're welcome to use that with your patients. And then the final area. Building target marketing um, and focusing your target marketing on what saves time. Uh, remembering that that's the big deal. It's saving time for your patients. It's saving time for your providers. We think of patient engagement, but really it's, in, it's getting them to engage through the portal because it saves time. It allows them to engage in better ways because they can do it at times that are most, most uh, um, important for them or uh, that they have uh, time to do it. Uh, targeting specific patient use, 
Uh, we'll talk about that here in a second, but you might want to, you know, to, to realize that some of your patients would use the portal if it has a very specific use. And then making the marketing um, tool that you use very flexible, make it stand alone. So you don't have to have somebody, um, you know, redo it every day or fix a marketing technique or put a lot of resources into redoing that marketing campaign. But make the marketing campaign flexible and stand alone as much as possible. And I'll show you what that means here. And we have a survey question for you. Our last survey question. And I think Helen is bringing it up now. Here it is. What marketing poster location is the best for increasing portal use? Putting a poster in an exam room, a pharmacy waiting line area, a lab draw area, or a waiting room? Where do you think it might make the most impact putting a, a poster? All right. Do we have uh, the responses in? Waiting room. Interesting. Um, so 100% have selected the waiting room as the best place to uh, put a poster to increase portal use. What I find, uh, and that's exactly what every one of the portal teams uh, suggests uh, putting the posters to start with. And I will tell you that um, what we learned from uh, uh, the presentation at that same meeting with Kaiser is they saw a dramatic, uh, statistically significant, huge jump, if you will, uh, when they put a poster in the lab draw area. And they put it right in front of where you get your blood taken. Uh, and it says, would you like to see the results of this lab uh, this blood draw within 24 hours. I, th I think it was within 24 hours or within 48 hours when they first started, but now it's within 24 hours. And that drove a lot of signups. Uh, and I'll go now to the next slide. So it's important to sort of think about what might motivate specific targeted groups of patients. Um, and there's the aha moment. What was the absolute best marketing action to jump portal enrollment and use? Put a poster right in front of the, of the blood draw chair. Want to see your results in 24 hours? And here's an example um, of a sustainable, um, flexible uh, type of uh, marketing uh, process as well. One of, uh, one of our uh, rural safety net clinics came up with this idea, and I think about 80% of uh, the, team, the teams that I work with now use this. It's where they have an acrylic uh, 11 by 17 holder that they can switch in and out posters. Uh, they can make it flexible in terms of how they use it in each of the exam rooms, in the waiting room, in the lab draw area, and they attach to that a uh, acrylic trifold holder and put a trifold about the the uh, patient portal in there. And that allows patients to, if they want to get more information, they don't have to ask a person. They've seen the poster, it's moving to them in some way, they grab one of those trifolds. And so ends up that the marketing department or uh, the, M the lead MA in the, each area make sure that those uh, trifold uh, holders are filled all the time and that has driven up their enrollment significantly. This direction. So my shared resources for you uh, in this particular area is uh, free, unrestricted poster artwork. Uh, there you see the link to it, encouraging people to go there. Uh, you're, it's in Spanish and in English. There are PowerPoints. You can grab them. You can download them. You can change them and add your logo to it and use them immediately without any uh, need for reimbursement or permissions. Uh, they're all there, paid for by CHCF to be free for everyone's use. In the future. In the future, expect portals to better address language barriers, uh, to be in other languages, to better address disparities in access to patient engagement processes through the use and more attention to the ways in which our most underserved patients access the internet, uh, in particular the use of smartphones. Uh, we found that 80% of the homeless HIV patients in this study with San Francisco General Hospital, even though they were homeless, 80% had a smartphone. Uh, minors uh, use of portal is on the rise, especially in school-based programs, but uh, overcoming the issues of uh, state laws with regard to release of information is becoming uh, solved and put into more and more portals. Text connections, e-visits, telemedicine, mobile engagement, uh, these are topics that are coming up in this same CIN series that you'll see uh, applications on portals for as well. And then social connectedness. Uh, patients who have specific chronic diseases will be able to connect through their portal to 
large support sites or social groups, and that will become more and more prevalent. And then the final aha of the presentation, we absolutely need to figure out how to reduce barriers to meaningful access to a patient's trusted primary care team. If we don't, patients will continue to seek, continually seek other sources of advice or end up seeking care in the ER or urgent care um, de uh, department. So that's from one of our CMOs at a safety net uh, network. And so I'm opening up now. We have uh, four minutes left, five minutes left uh, for any questions that uh, folks have that have not come through the chat box. You're welcome to chat them in, uh, and uh, Hunter or Helen will help us uh, get that to me. And here, uh, just as a reminder, are the 10 areas from the AHA. Great, Jim. Thank you. So yeah, anyone, um, Alan, thank you for your participation before. Anyone can chat into the either the chat box or the question box that should be on your control panel. Mine showed up on the left side of my screen. Any questions? globally about portals or related to any of these really nice practical 10 ideas to work with. I've also left my uh, email address at the bottom of each slide and if you think of something after this call or if you're listening to the recording uh, at any time feel free to email me any questions you have as well. I think what I'll do now is uh, I'll move on to the next slide. Uh, it's the thank you slide, certainly, for the opportunity to uh, present today. And, and Hunter, thanks very much for asking uh, and, and working with me on this particular idea of using AHAs. Um, the resources that are out there, uh, there's going to be a Dropbox site that I will open that will have all of the resources that I've mentioned in this particular webinar on it. And I'll keep that open through the first part of January. Uh, there's also a website at the California Healthcare Foundation funded by them and also hosted by them that has a lot of resources on it. And this is where I will direct folks to the free artwork. Um, and then the Colorado Health Foundation, uh, I'm working with them right now to build a knowledge center for patient portals, which will open up in April 2016, which will also have uh, these same, uh, many of these same resources. Not all 500, it'll probably end up being about 100 or so of those. But you'll, uh, when that comes out, uh, you'll uh, be able to search that as well. And then I and just would open myself up to the folks who have any questions or uh, requests for resources. They can also reach me at, with the with my telephone number there or my email address. Great, thank you, Jim. Jim, and there's one more so, question from Al. Um, Jim, this is Helen. There's one more question from Alan. Sure. Um, it says, Have you seen any provider groups integrate their patient portal with health plan portal? Are there any? Let's see. Any key criteria to consider on whether or not to integrate provider and health plan portals? Uh, that would be outside my my knowledge set. I I have seen some very innovative, especially uh, very recently in in a cannibal care organization formatting um, where they're beginning to share across portals and across EHRs. But I would say that the common denominator is interoperability, and right now we haven't solved a lot of that. So the vast majority of, of this uh, sharing is, is limited today to, the, I, again, I'm not an expert in this area, there may be more progressive groups, is limited to those who share the same EHR platform. So if you're an ECW uh, member, uh, then there's, there's the ability to link across. Um, that's my only experience to date. Any other questions? It's a great question. I think this is a, that's the wave of the future, obviously. Yeah. Jim, would you pull up the last slide of my four bookend slides, please, so I can yep. show people some of the upcoming events. So thank you all. But again, yeah, Jim has made himself available after the webinar. The recording will be posted in about a week. Um, and I will forward, either Helen or I will forward the uh, Dropbox invitation to get all the resources that Jim is assembling there to help all of you who are signed up. We have your emails, of course. Um, and we'll send that to you when that is ready. A um, few other things happening, other opportunities within the California Improvement Network offerings from the California Healthcare Foundation. Our next uh, webinar in this series of alternatives to face-to-face -face visits is on text messaging, and it's about health plan enrollment is the case, is the case example, the case study, using text messaging as a mobile communications 
as part of a mobile communication strategy. That's from 12.30 to 1.30 the same time, January 26th. Tomorrow is the deadline for a, um, a motivational interviewing um, training. Um, so if you get the CIN newsletter, it was in the most recent two CIN newsletters where you may have heard about this webinar. Um, or you can go to calquality.org and it's linked on their homepage. It's a great free two-day training. Uh, again, the deadline is tomorrow. So if you haven't started on that, you would need to hustle to get in on that opportunity. Great resource uh, and free. And then if you're on this webinar but you didn't get the CIN newsletter announcing this session and other activities directly, please join. All you need to do is go to the website, the CIN homepage listed here as part of the CHCF website, and uh, click the little button that says sign up and you will get the monthly CIN newsletter. It's about once a month with all these different opportunities listed. And with that, we are right at the top of the, right at the end of the hour here. Um, thank you for your participation and we will end the session today. Thank you very much, Jim. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you.